What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Smoking Tire Podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by Off the Record. Love Off the Record. They take care of the things I need taken care of. And what am I talking about? I'm talking about tickets, of course. In fact, I got a text message from my sister in law down in San Diego who uh, was very excited about Off the Record because they made it go away. Sent me that screenshot. Your ticket has been dismissed. Love that screenshot. You get that email, and it says, warning, do not reply to this email. You've received a message from your attorney. Your ticket has been fully dismissed. Thank you, Off the Record. Never plead guilty to a moving violation. Use Off the Record instead. All you have to do is go to offtherecord.com slash TST or use code TST10 on the Off the Record app and Off the Record will fight that ticket on your behalf and help get those points off your record. In fact, you don't pay them if they don't get the points off your record. And just remember, the points that come with a ticket, they follow you around. They affect your insurance rates. They cost you money. They could potentially, depending on what you do for a living, even affect your livelihood. So always fight your tickets with Off the Record. Code TST10 on the Off the Record app or offtherecord.com slash TST. They'll connect you with a qualified attorney in the jurisdiction where you got that ticket, and they'll fight that ticket on your behalf. Never plead guilty. It's Off the Record. You know what's up. Today, it is a crew show. I come back from the HQ 400 uh, road and track event and talk about the M8 competition I drove and a horrible ride that I had to the airport that drove me insane. Uh, we talk about uh, charging, DC fast charging etiquette and wait times. I reveal an insane parts bill for my Lamborghini. And uh, Zach was in Tennessee with Mr. Sam Smith uh, fixing old cars plenty going on and we got a lot of great uh, patreon questions to get through as well it is the smoking tire podcast <laughs> uh welcome to the show it's going up a little later in the day than we wanted but uh you know it's free so here we are uh, a bit of housekeeping some folks have sent us some very kind gifts shout out to our listener andrew who sent me this beautiful ducati book uh, looks very nice. I haven't even opened it yet, but it's uh, The Art of Ducati. Ooh. So that's fun. They're uh, so pretty. That's for the coffee table. And uh, shout out to, I believe, I believe your first name is Alistair uh, Campbell from England. Oh, Mr. Yes. I think that says Alistair. He wrote a very nice note. I think it's Alistair with a with an A. I think like, you are correct. Yeah. Uh, if that's not your first name, I apologize. But this is a very nice letter. It's pronounced and, aluminium. And sent this, uh, this, this Play Forever company is like all over the place now. They're doing these sort of kids toys that uh, vaguely but not so but pretty closely resemble uh, vintage cars. And so this one uh, uh, looks like a Countach, mm -hmm. which is pretty cool. Someone else sent us one that looked like a Porsche. And I was just in a toy store recently, and there are a lot of these. They're really popular what now. What is that one called? This one's called the the UFO 77 Leonessa. Ah, so it's outside the, the realm of copyright infringement. It is, it is, it is approaching, but not infringing. Yeah. Uh, the trademark. I don't know. That's maybe cool. they did get like a it. maybe they did get a license. But I mean, this one, I mean, it's it's definitely a cartoonized Countach. It absolutely is, and it's pretty cool. It's very cool. I mean, how many it. of the cars we had that were Hot Wheels when we were kids? Oh, were, Leo Nessa like is the color. whatever or Micro Machines. They didn't look like actual cars. They were just fun. Yeah. Um, these the, so these are very fun. So shout out to uh, shout out to Mr. Uh, Campbell for sending that. It? Does it have a tiny helmet in it? Yeah, it's got a it's got like a little like a a Daft Punk helmet in yeah. there. <laughs> And then uh, our buddy uh, who's been on the show before, Ryan Zumalin, uh, automotive journalist, sent us a copy of his new book, The Cult of GTR, A True Story of Crime, Obsession, and the World's Most Coveted Car. It's about Skylines. And uh, according to Zach here, edited by Sam Smith. Yeah. Which is nice. And uh, I look forward to reading that. I've been needing some new airplane reading material. So send us a couple copies of that. And if you're into Skylines, which who the fuck isn't into Skylines, go check out The Cult of GTR, available now from uh, Ryan Zumalin. So shout out to all those nice folks who sent us things. Um, 
And then also, we got some good feedback on the pens. Remember, we talked mm -hmm. about the pens. It seems like uh, that people were into doing a, a pen collab. So he's sending me some samples of some like PVD coatings. They can they can do these coated in different colors. So at first they sent they were like, do you want to do a frozen berry? And I was like, that sounds fun, but I don't know if frozen berry will work on something small. It mm, typically only works yeah. on big things, but I want to see what it looks like. So they're making one. They're also doing another one that has our logo on the end cap here really small and they're doing another one that has some engravings here so they're sending me some options uh, but it, it seems like we may have a pen collab cool so if people are into these high quality um, like bolt action rifle pens they are very satisfying um, and also I was uh, a correction from a previous show it's important to issue the corrections up front when you learn things um, it seems that four states in the union now have some variation of lane splitting laws meaning legal oh. I, mean, I said i said on the show that we were talking about lane splitting that yeah. california is the only state where you can uh there are four other states that do um of course i should have pulled up which they are hmm. uh, someone said utah was one of them but only if traffic is stopped so that's halfway there is that not fact checked? No, uh, Forbes did an article. It says only California directly permits it, but mm. several other states um, allow similar behaviors, such as what they call lane filtering. Lane Arizona, filtering, yeah. So Arizona, lane filtering Montana, is where it's and Utah. So those are the ones where if cars are stopped, mm. that's that's how that's defined as lane filtering. Lane splitting is when you can pretty much do it. Um, up right up to basically highway speeds. Hawaii allows shoulder surfing. That's a fucking great term. Yeah, it is. I love that. So I think you can cruise down the shoulder and stop yeah, traffic. Yeah, sure. That's a that and that's good. And you should be able to lane filter or lane split. So, mm -hmm. uh, so thank you to the person. Even though, let me just add that the person that informed me about this did so with a bit more of an attitude than they really needed to. It was sort of a, hey, do your homework kind of thing, as opposed to, hey, just so you know, these laws have been updated. So, like, happy to be corrected. Going to make a thing of it. Going to show that we're all learning together. But, like... It's part of the homework process. Learning as a community. Uh, how many people will do that? would do this correction, would make a point? Not a lot. Would make a whole thing about learning the updated truth and sharing it. But what, like, we, what we would really do is we double down on the definition of lane splitting and be like, we're actually not talking about the same thing. Yeah, right. No. Lane splitting, lane filtering. California is still the only place you can full on lane split. We need to get to the definition of what split is. That would be the Jordan right. Peterson response. Right. <laughs> yeah. uh, so uh, that's uh, that's the thing. Um, where did you just get back from? I was in Tennessee. Oh. Uh, hanging out with, um, oops, hanging that's, out with Sam Smith and well, Sarah's family came into town and did you work on old shitty cars uh yeah well i watched sam fix an ignition thing and i learned a lot about old cars and when people add wires to ignition switches in their tenure so sam pulled this thing apart and he had a wiring diagram and he's like why is this wheel wire here i go i don't know and he's there's like, well, we extra gotta. so what, what was going to be like a 20 minute repair turned into a two hour you know detective mission yeah um, but i saw a speedy cop oh you did he you went, did there. you go to his little farm over there i went to his yeah, he has 20 acres, Yeah, and he built, like, a huge, you know, four-bay, like, giant structure for all, working on all this stuff, which mm -hmm. is really cool. He has so many projects. Of course. So many. Yeah. Um, and he is a five-year-old who has retirement money. <laughs> yeah. He built a zip line that, uh -huh. like, you can order from a company called Zipline.com, so it's not like he engineered it himself. But it goes across a valley. It's, like, big? It's big. Yeah. It's 800 feet long oh that's big it, yeah that's a big uh, zip line yeah and then he when he set it up he goes he's trying to convince all of us to do it i'm like i don't know man and he go, and he said something was funny uh i got six degrees and six percent grade mixed up and when he said that i went i'm not doing this yeah because yeah. it was steeper than it should which be is, he, which is more i think percent is steeper like percent. like you know when you're on the highway and it yeah, says yeah, yeah. truckers yeah five percent grade yeah. coming up Five degree can slope we, is not very. Can big. you check that? What sure. is the difference between degrees and percent? Because I'm not really. Well, I guess uh, here's the. Oh, this would make sense. A hundred percent grade would be ninety degrees, but it's a vertical drop, right? 
So 100%, so you multiply by four, right, for degrees, right? Because if it's a quadrant, right? Actually, as the slope approaches vertical, 90 degrees, the yeah. percentage slope approaches infinity. Oh, oh, so it's like an exponential uh, thing. Yeah. yeah, so this says yeah, yeah. a slope of 45 approaches degrees. Infinity. Okay, so that's different. A 45 degree slope expressed yeah. as a percentage, the angle is 100%. Oh, um, okay. So, oh, so, so that's why. So degrees is much, much more. Yeah, yeah. Let's see, a 20% slope in degrees. No, no, per, I'm sorry, percentage is much, much more. Percentage is, is more. An 11.3 right. degree slope uh -huh. is 20 percent oh okay yeah, yeah yeah oh so so which way did he build he it? went steeper by accident <laughs> okay. and he was fine and there's a break on it and stuff and we watched him do it yeah but i just looked did at, you not end up ultimately i did not do partake. It? did anybody other than him no <laughs> was was there a weight limit other people have done it yeah and there and I, I read all the instructions on this website to see how you test it to make sure it's safe and he did all those things mm. I mean, the guy knows how to build stuff yeah yeah for me it was like <laughs> Do I want to hold my torso up on this harness and risk versus reward? No offense right. to Speedy Cop. You were a great host, and thank right. you for the museum type tour. But I was just like, maybe I not. just got better. <laughs> I just healed my spine again. Totally. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. That's awesome. Good times. Yeah, I'm going to cool. Tennessee in, uh, for Thanksgiving. Pigeon Forge. Oh, we drove through there. Yeah. It's crazy, isn't it? Uh, what, what is something that you would not <laughs> expect there to be? Seven of in Pigeon Forge. <sighs> there are so many things. In Democratic Forge. voting centers. <laughs> Do you, no, there uh, are seven go kart tracks. Oh yeah, three of which are next to each other. Oh really? And they're okay. very similar. It's kind. They're kind of shaped. Did you like, do any of them? No. Okay. We, we had we, were they meant for like kids? Yeah. Yeah. It honestly. Four of them, you just drive up a spiral like we do when we go oh, to a parking I've seen garage, the spiral and you ones. drive down. Sure, I've a seen lot of the spiral. Those. But I was ones, just yeah. shocked. There's not more F1 drivers coming out of this place because there were yeah. so many. Well, it's, it's Dollywood, right? That's the, that's nearby. That, well, that's that's what started it. Oh, Dollywood, okay. Dollywood was there, and all of that shit on the big main drag of Pigeon Forge is now like ah. grown up around Dollywood as like more shit to do. I can't wait for you to see. The attraction. I've seen it. I okay. I, I, I have driven we talked through about there. It, I think like two weeks yeah, ago. Yeah, because no, because I went to the. Remember, I did the mountain coaster there. Mm -hmm. The guy who came on the road and track event was like, "By the way, I own an alpine coaster in Pigeon Forge," and Hannah and I were like, "Yeah, we're going to that." Yeah, and we went. And so, shout out to Rocky Top Mountain Coaster in Pigeon Forge. But um, there's all kinds of other like really weird shit there. There's a store that has live alligators, and yeah. you get a free hermit crab if you buy its house. Um, there's a, uh, just amazing things. Is it, it's house, it's a shell? So you buy a shell? No, and I think a, you buy like, you buy a, like a terrarium, an enclosure, or an aquarium, yeah. whichever one it would be. <laughs> I think it's a terrarium. There's a uh, Paula Deen's dinner theater. Right. Hatfield and McCoy rivalry there's dinner like theater. There's like the mystery, mo there's a mystery, uh, murder mystery dinner theater. Yep. There's like a Titanic fucking thing. There's, there's like a Godzilla thing. We are, my wife's family and me are going to a... Dolly Parton Southern fucking revival dinner theater for Thanksgiving. That is going to be our Thanksgiving dinner. All right. We going to be. See how factually accurate that is. Right. So, well, wait, it's Dolly Parton's thing? It's Dolly Parton's. She's a good person. Better Dolly Parton's than Paula Deen's. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Dolly Parton is a, yeah. a good person. Yeah, okay. so it's probably going to be okay, but like that's, I'll be there in a couple of weeks. It was pretty cool. It was pretty And cool. I am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I am gonna. I, I'm grabbing a Ky a new Cayenne S from Porsche for that thing. They have the V8 in it now, so there'll be well, there'll be a car review coming from Pigeon Forge nice. um, ultimately, and it is near enough to uh, the Dragon oh, where yeah. I could take a quick lap. Go on the Parkway. We went up there. It's the roads are so yeah. Smooth. Oh, on the Skyway, yeah, Charahola Skyway. Yeah, yeah, it's excellent. Um, so I was doing uh, Hudson Quattrocento, the HQ 400 Road and Track Experiences event. Uh, it went very, very well. Uh, everybody was happy. The you know the roads in the Catskills are just amazing in October. Just absolutely incredible. So beautiful. Fucking upstate New Yorkers, though, the disdain that they have for other people driving on their roads. Totally different <laughs> from California, totally different from Smoky Mountains, totally different from Colorado. In, in California, if a, a local is just driving up the road and sees a group of sports cars coming up behind them, nine times out of 10, they pull out of the way within a mile. True. 
in upstate New York, they are so offended that you are there. They're so offended by your presence. It could be because of the sports cars. And I'm not talking about us driving like shitbags. We do not drive like shitbags in these events. We we drive in a, in a sporting manner, but no one's crossing double yellows. No one's going crazy fast. No one's doing anything stupid. It's just a nice, it's a nice scenic cruise, right? But these people get fucking mad as hell at, that you're there, and they will drive 34 in a 35 for 12 miles in the wrong direction just so you're fucking behind them. Do you think that's because there are so few driving roads in New York that, like, they're the only destination for every sports car owner in the area? Well, it's it's— Or are they just jerks? It's also, like, leaf peeper stuff. <laughs> you know, like, people go up there to see the leaves change, yeah. and so they get mad at that. Like, they're just like, get out of our towns, you yeah, know, whatever. Okay. And, I mean, there's probably some, let's call it class resentment as well. You know, if you're not able to own a fucking Porsche and you see a line of Porsches. But isn't that who comes and buys antiques from all these antique I mean, places? Probably, yeah. And I'm not trying to, I, I'm not trying to, like, express class solidarity with the rich people here. I'm talking about road manners, you know, yeah. more than anything else. Like, you see this line of cars behind you, you could just move out of the way, wait 10 seconds, they'll be gone, and you go about your fucking day. But there was like a seething rage among some of these people, which was expressed by brake checking, uh, hand gestures out the window, all kinds of shit, screaming at us. Like, it was pretty gnarly. I was kind of like, it was, it, I don't usually get that. And, uh, and then meanwhile, like, you know, dude in like a 3,500 fucking dually towing an open trailer fucking blasts through the town, like rolling coal everywhere and like no rage towards that guy. You know, that guy lives here. Mm -hmm. He can do whatever the fuck he wants, you know. Um, but it was, I mean, despite a couple instances of, of local road rage, it was a, it was a lovely event. Um, I was supposed to drive that black wing. Didn't happen. Somebody, the the day I was supposed to be delivered the car, somebody had a little whoopsie in it, and I, it could not. It wasn't uh, totaled, but it could not be used. That sucks. And so they gave me an M8 competition as a backup car, which, guys, got to take a quick break from the action for today's sponsor, NASCAR. And uh, they are a big sponsor of us, and we really appreciate it. NASCAR's 75th anniversary season has undoubtedly lived up to the hype. We've had awesome finishes, breakout seasons, and unexpected results by some of the top drivers on the grid, and it is not over yet. For the remaining field of eight playoff contenders, it all comes down to Martinsville, because a win here launches you to the championship in Phoenix. Drivers have taken on super speedways, tri-ovals, road courses, even the streets of Chicago this season, but if they want to punch their ticket to the championship, they'll have to conquer the short track in NASCAR Mar Martinsville Speedway. This half mile of mayhem will put drivers to the test as they battle in tight quarters for 500 miles of action-packed short track racing. It's make or break time for those looking to secure their spot in the championship four at Phoenix next weekend. Invite over some friends, flip on the TV, and tune in to watch the NASCAR Cup Series Playoffs Elimination Race presented by Xfinity at Martinsville, Sunday, October 29th, 2 p.m. Eastern on NBC. I do not understand this car, particularly as specified, because this is a GT car, right? It's an expensive GT car, mm -hmm. and it's fast. It's, it's, it's got a lot of power. It's got a responsive gearbox. But this thing had a suspension that was made of fucking bricks. I mean, the worst r ride quality for a luxury car, this thing rode like garbaggio. And then it had the carbon fiber buckets. Like, who the fuck wants a 4,000 pound plus GT Tourer with carbon fiber buckets and that rides like shit? Like, who is that customer? People that want to show off but are going to be uncomfortable while they do it. So crazy. What did your dad think of the seats? He hated them. I mean, he was a good sport. <laughs> he tolerated it, you know, and, like, it wasn't so bad that he was, like, complaining about it. But he even he was like, what is this car? Like, who wants this? And, 
it's not like I drove it on the track. I drove it at Lime Rock, and like, it's not like this discomfort has a real trade off in on track performance. Oh, like, it's it's pretty fast, but like it's still really heavy. The carbon ceramic brakes were were fine, but not super impressive because it's a really heavy car. Remember the last M8 we drove was uh, Carbons. Yeah. So how did can you remember that was better? How that felt because they they did a bunch of suspension work. Yeah, it had that V3s. It rode it rode better. Yeah. And and it didn't have those dumb seats. Yeah. And it was very responsive. Yeah. So. This one, this one, there was a real and also it it really felt like more car than tire. This had some P zeros on it that it was pretty easy to overwhelm at Lime Rock, um, and uh, I just like it, there was a lot about it that was very confusing and disjointed. It did not seem. It seemed like they could have, if they wanted to, built a car that was. T- Three quarters of a way to a Bentley GT for half the price, mm-hmm. but they just made. Instead, they tried to make a bigger M4, which I just I don't know who wants that. Which yeah, is probably no. why I don't see a lot of them. By the way, this is not a car. LA is where you see expensive ass cars. Like I see very few of these on the street. They're not common. I wonder if that is because genuinely, like if the LA roads are bad, the customer that would probably buy this i think it's a very, uh, an extroverted person who makes more money than m4 money yeah but not enough for bentley money and then they go well this is going to ride like garbage around here so i'll get yeah. something else yeah or people are getting more of the like performance luxury coupes or like, suv coupes instead right like mm-hmm. i probably would have rather had an x3m honestly for half the money of this, the X3M is probably just as quick realistically in a straight that line. It also rode pretty stiff. It was stiff, but it wasn't as bad as this. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. And the, the seats amplify it. You know, yeah. this, this, they're this, really this, firm. They're really firm. The The thigh bolsters are really, really hard. Um, and and they're probably, they're fine if you want a track day seat, but like who the who is getting an M8 with these seats? Like it just makes no sense. So... It was suboptimal for the intended uh, purpose, and you know, frankly, I didn't. I just I didn't enjoy driving it at all. I mean, it, I wish we could see the spec or the numbers on the miles covered in a car like this by owners. Like, do they buy it and they drive it to work in the club, and because they like when yeah. you open the door and you have these cool seats and it looks cool, but it actually yeah. isn't very nice to drive around. And do they return the lease with like? 3,000 miles left versus yeah. something softer. I mean, I remember Andreas from uh, from Alpina, which, by the way, RIP to his dad, the founder of Alpina, who passed away like two weeks ago. Um, he said his clients drive their cars 40,000 kilometers a year. They do distance. That's, that's yeah. who chooses an Alpina. And that makes a lot of sense because th- that is most of the way to a Bentley GT. Mm-hmm. Um and still, like real fast, oh, of like course. and handling handles great. Um, so, like, and that type of car, like, I'd rather have a, a an M3 than an Alpina 3 Series. But I'd much rather have, in terms of a large coupe or the Grand Coupe or a, a sedan, I'd mu- I'd much rather have the Alpina than a than an. an M- and granted, I didn't ask for this car. Like, it was just what was available literally on the same day. Yeah. Um, that would be that I could take on the track and 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 that was, you know, befitting the mission of this. Um, but man, did I not like it at all? I mean, the competition, whether it was the M3 or the M2, it's always been much stiffer than the normal version. Right. In many cases, a slightly worse, unless you're on the right environment, the right road, etc. And then if you go up to CS level, then now it gets you better have the magic. again. Yeah, because they don't just make it stiffer; they put a much more expensive shock. Yeah, you know, it's all about the wheel control. Yeah, yeah. So the competition is this weird in between. Yeah, where it's, it's like you put lower and then they do CSL and, stuff. and make it worse again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but then you know what you're getting into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm glad they didn't weren't they didn't send me a CSL. That would have been. Um, hmm. well, that's, a, that's unfortunate. It was kind of unfortunate because other you know. On paper, it's got the it's got the exact stuff you want for a 500 mile, you know, beautiful driving roads kind of trip with a little bit of track work. 
And we went to Wilzig's place, which was nuts. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we private went to Wilzig racetrack. Manor, private racetrack. Um, absolutely amazing. If I had $20 million to burn on something, this I would be doing exactly what this guy is doing. I mean, the track was amazing. And what you really Ooh. can't see in this aerial photo here is um, the banking on on the photo, it's the bottom left. It's at the the nine o'clock position. No, the other oh. one, the other one there. That that banking is about twenty degrees. That is a bowl, a proper proper bowl. Like it's like a like somewhere between Nurburgring Carousel and NASCAR. Wow. And it's pretty aggressive. And also, the there's a, quite a noticeable elevation change. The the section Here. that's at the, the the center, the top center where there's a crossover there, that's the highest point of the track. And then the left side, the lower, the two court sort of bowls on the left side are the lowest point of the track. And there's about an 80-foot difference between the two. Um, it's a pretty notable uh, elevation change. And then you can see the lake on the right. Mm -hmm. That he's got like a jet ski racing course in that lake. Oh my God. Um, that that's his. Uh, the, there's the building on the bottom right of the photo, which is where the the cars and the motorcycles are kept, and then up in the that's his house. So he's just living just right there. The garage is eight times larger than the house. Yeah, the wow. house the house is like an old farmhouse, and it's it's lovely, and it's got a cool like pool and outdoor area, and there's like sort of a a boat. Uh, you can sort of see it right in the lake. There's like a boat garage. A boathouse there, which is pretty rad, and it, this is an incredible piece of property. Um, but the house itself is pretty unassuming compared to the fact that there's a fucking racetrack wow. and a giant shop, you know, yeah. next to what it. What a way to live! Um, but yeah, dude, twenty four seven, whenever you want, lapping that bitch, um, and uh, <laughs> pretty pretty amazing. I mean, it's like a fifty seven fifty six second lap time, uh, which is basically the same lap time as Lime Rock. But Lime Rock is 50% longer. Mm -hmm. So, wow. yeah. So there's this, Wilzig is tighter and has more corners than yeah. Lime Rock. Lime Rock has got the longer straight and right. the downhill, which are much faster. Yeah. But um, to get to do both in a, two days in a row was pretty neat. That's pretty rad. Yeah, yeah. It was very $20 fun. million? Dollars, that's what we need? I think he built it for 10 Okay. But that was like in 2010. And it would cost oh. you at least twice that to do it today. Okay. Um, but it's like the surface is amazing. The curbing is amazing. Like it, the M8 is way too big of a car, but he typically rides motorcycles. He's got a few Lotuses. He's got an aerial Atom like that for that kind okay. of shit. It's like 2000 pound fling about lightweight, car. small cars, bikes, shifter carts, like Ooh. all of that stuff. Cater him. Perfect. Mm -hmm. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. That's small great. lightweight cars. Just, just amazing. So what a treat to uh, to get to go drive that, you know. Um, and so it was a really fun time. And go to experiences.roadandtrack.com. We've got three events for next year. We've got the Smoky 600 in May. We've got the Colorado one in September, Rocky Mountains. And then we've got the Arizona High Desert in November if you want to come drive with me. Uh, bro, I had, I had like one of the worst – so my parents in Greenwich, Connecticut, right, it's like an hour on a good day to JFK. It's like probably the worst part about seeing my parents is that airport ride from J from JFK to Greenwich and from Greenwich back to JFK. And uh, my parents are real old school, and so no no Ubers for them. It's the, the livery service, the old school black car service, the, you know, the phone call, there's a text confirmation, and fine, whatever they want to do. They got There's a company they like, but... I had the worst airport ride to from Greenwich back to the airport pro possibly ever. First off, the dude, uh, I get in the car, and this dude is, like, wheezing. Like, he's breathing so heavy that I can hear it through noise-canceling AirPods. So, like, within – fortunately, I was – on my way to the airport and I keep, um, you know, I keep a mask in my, in my bag and I, I had to do the very awkward thing of putting on a mask about five minutes into, you know, so he has, he's there like, and I'm like reaching for my bag, like, and kind of like trying to keep my, cause this guy's breathing. He's got like a little cough and really deep, heavy breathing. It's mm -hmm. like 
fucking this guy have like COVID or like emphysema right. or you know what I mean? And like, is and he very overweight? No, is it like okay, no, he was like an Eastern European guy, and like who knows, maybe he smokes like ten packs of cigarettes a day, which normally I would like smell that, but I didn't. But so there's that. Then this motherfucker is doing like five under the speed limit everywhere. And I've used this limo service or livery service. It wasn't a limo. It was like a regular Tahoe. But I've used this service in the past, and all of their drivers never go above five miles an hour above the speed limit, which is kind of frustrating, but they're probably instructed to do this. And I know to leave enough time to deal with it. But this guy's going five under. He's never using more than like 10 or 15% throttle. He's accelerating like real slow, merges real slow. He which, doesn't get up to the speed of traffic on no, highways? Ooh, no, no. That's, that's so scary. Which is which is scary enough, but which would be fine if you're then staying in the right lane. But he, would, he went into the left lane and is going 50 and a 55 or 60 in the left lane. And then when people either pass on the right out me. of frustration yeah. or if he perceived them as getting too close to him in any way – Lay in on the horn. He probably honked twenty to thirty times in an hour, and and this the ah, ah, like everyone else is nuts. Okay, while he's going slow as fuck so and just rolling roadblock and <laughs> breathing like that, and I'm just going like, oh my god, like fucking, please don't. Give me this. Give me COVID in this. Fucking he's he's bringing you into his conflict. Oh my god! Which is and your then, favorite? Then, folks, just a quick break for today's sponsor, Electric Bikes. Not electric bikes, even though that's what they are. But I'm talking about electric e-bikes, right? Not electric bikes. Electric. E-bikes. Fall is the perfect time to shift how you see things and experiencing the season from an e-bike can accelerate all of the amazing things about getting outside. And electric e-bikes are a fun, easy, and affordable way to get moving with pedal assist and throttle included, plus a convenient foldable design you can take your fall adventures to a whole new level. I rode my electric e-bike from my house to the office this morning for real. And it's money. Electric e-bikes start at just $7.99 with the XP Lite. And uh, these bikes are awesome. An electric bike, specifically an electric e-bike, can change your life because it makes biking to things way easier, uh, uh, easier on your body, easier to get up steep hills. And there's a bunch of accessories like the baskets and the lights, the flashers, the reflections. Uh, it can really expand the zone that you would normally maybe not ride a traditional bike in, right? With electric e-bike, you can save on traditional transportation costs like gas, parking, and maintenance. They've got financing as low as 73 bucks a month, so you can get started today. And there's no assembly required. Your electric e-bikes will ship free, fully assembled, and it's foldable for easy travel and storage anywhere you go. E-bikes can be heavier, and so you have to be a little careful when you pick it up, but the folding design does allow me to put it in the trunk of my car, take it with me, and pull it out and unfold it, ride it, uh, so it expands the reach of where I would use that e-bike. Uh, in most states, licensing and registration are not required for e-bikes, and you can enjoy the same road access as a standard bike, but you should always check the laws in your area. But I ride anything in about within about three miles, four miles of my house. I'm all about that e-bike. It makes the commute enjoyable and relaxing. And even this morning on the way to work, there's a couple traffic lights and cars just pile up at that morning rush hour area. I passed like 300 cars. Like I got here so much faster than if I was in a car. And with a pedal assist and high battery life, you can just cover more distance and get more range out of your ride. So shift into a new way of getting out there with an electric e-bike like the XP Lite starting at just $799. Visit electricebikes.com to find the electric model for you. That's L E C T R I C ebikes.com you know he's got ways going i can see the i could see the screen you know he's got the ways going but then he decides that he disagrees with ways so at a certain point when you're going to jfk airport in new york it, you go to the van wick expressway which is 
one of the worst highways, worst, worst stretches of highway on the planet. It's always under construction. There's always fucking traffic. But this is like a Sunday morning, and it's pretty empty. But he decides he's going to go surface streets. Bails off. And it, there's a ton of traffic on the service streets. We're sitting at these lights. I'm, and I can, you, it's next to the highway. So I'm watching cars go by. And after a minute, I go, hey, man, just why'd you get off the highway? And he goes, oh, I thought the surface streets, you know, would be better. And I go, okay, well, like, I can see, can see the highway moving right now. And we're sitting here at a light. And then the lights start to turn green. And he is not showing any kind of urgency to get through the lights. You know what I mean? Like the car in front goes and he's on his 10% throttle, stopping at yellows. And he has an opportunity to get back on the highway with an entrance ramp and there's a car kinda next to him. And he could have easily, and even after I, this is after I said something, he could have easily sped up to go around or it's dropped in behind, easily. There's no other, and I go, hey, why don't you get back on the highway? He goes, oh, this lady, she don't let me in. And I'm watching this, and I was like, you made no <laughs> motion to go there. Like, he, like she's supposed to telepathically know that he wanted to go there when he didn't signal or he didn't do it, try anything. This man is single because he's never been asked out. And like, I'm nobody like, nobody ever asked I'm me I'm like out. fucking losing my mind back here right now. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and, and he's, and, you know, the surface streets are bumpy because it's fucking Queens. But we're in a Tahoe, and he's going, like, crawl speed. He's clearly trying to make the ride more comfortable, but, like, I'm just like, fucking go, bro. Like, you know, just losing my shit. And eventually we, we get back on the highway, and the same thing. He's, try, he going, he's going to merge back on the highway, like, 20 miles an hour slower than traffic is going. And, like... Cars are trying to go around, and he's fucking honking and flipping people off. They're not letting me in. It's like, dude, you are going way too slow. Like, you have not matched the speed. Any, like, it's this is like, this guy is in a universe where everybody is slighting him, and he is not participating in society in an appropriate fucking way. And I'm not saying that I want this guy to drive like a fucking, like he's in the cannonball, but like, just... The lack of awareness combined with this <laughs> this deep breathing for an hour and fucking 20 minutes under the speed limit. like You were so stressed. <laughs> so fucking mad, dude. I was so mad. Even though I had, like, plenty of time to make it to the plane, it wasn't – I gave myself lots of time, like – and but, like, it probably took, like, 20 minutes longer than Waze's estimate because of this guy's choices and, like – and then there was this fucking, and then as soon as I got back out of the car, I take the fucking mask off right in front of him. At that point, I was so annoyed. I'm like, fuck the awkwardness. I'm taking my mask off and letting him see it. <laughs> like, oh, it was killing me. Yeah, that would be a really rough It ride. was killing me. God forbid you, you didn't leave enough time and then you start watching the clock and watching your boarding time and get really stressed. Oh, my God. Yeah. Or God forbid I fucking didn't have a, like, I don't know. God forbid I didn't have a fucking mask on me. I would have really been losing my mind. Because now I'm just in the car with this guy and like, yeah, anyway. <laughs> um, speaking of craziness, uh, do we want to talk about, we can talk about uh, the bill Donnie just sent me. Oh, okay. Or we can talk about uh, people that are getting mad on Twitter because folks are using the DC fast chargers up to 100% charge. And not leaving at 80%. Which would you like to talk about? Uh, I'll take the second one first, Alex. Okay. So this was a thing on Twitter yesterday. And people were complaining, venting on Twitter, that people were charging their cars up to 100% and or leaving them. And because they weren't there, they were shopping or eating once the charging was finished. And apparently Electrify America in certain places doesn't charge idle time, charge you for idle time, which I think they should, mm -hmm. you know, like, I agree. Yeah. You know, but it's also like, I got, I don't, I think there's certain people that, that like know their habits for charging, like for how, for what their energy usage is. And they, go, okay, I only need to charge to 80%, and it takes a lot longer after that, so I'm going to charge to 80 and leave. And there's other people who are go, 
well, if I need to charge once a week, that 20% gets me another day and I'm already here yeah. and I'm already on the charger and I already waited to use the charger, I'm getting to 100. And so obviously there aren't enough chargers in the high demand areas. And, and obviously some people don't understand the slowdown of charge speed or don't care. But it's sort of like, the, the 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 venting on Twitter was like they they that people should give up their own twenty percent their own last twenty percent in order to make the line go faster to make room for anybody else. What are your thoughts? I don't think you should do that. I don't think you should be expected to to do that. I understand that the charging system it's just the way that the technology works. It has to slow down at eighty percent. If yeah. you can go the full speed all the way to hundred, great, like a like a gas tank, but it can't do that. But I don't think. I shouldn't be able to determine what another person's charging needs to be. Maybe they're on a road trip mm -hmm. and they need the 100 to get to the next place. I don't know. Uh, if you want to try to talk to them and ask like, hey, I'm in a rush. I need to get on here to go to this thing. You could do that. But I think it's up to the individual. Yeah. I do think they should charge for idle time because yeah. now you are sitting at the gas pump. It's not like if someone fills up their gas tank and they go inside to get snacks, I think there's always a limited amount. There's a limit to how long someone will spend in a gas station. Yeah, yeah. It's like eight minutes. Well, we've but kind of but dug but our own grave here by being like, well, we need to put chargers at places where people can spend their time. Yeah. And then now we're getting mad at people for spending their time there. Yeah, I mean, I think there's the expectation that if charging is going to take 30 minutes, they can go eat a simple lunch for 30 minutes. Yeah. But if there's a ton of things to do and they're just going to wander around and shop or have a one-hour sit-down you know, uh, lunch experience. Now you are holding up the charger, and I do. I do think that's annoying. I think that we're going to watch. Hopefully, there's going to be social norms created just through this kind of stress that leads to a certain behavior. Yeah, when we did the um, the performance EV of the year for Road and Track, the Walmart in Burbank that we were using to charge up the cars mm -hmm. throughout the day. I mean from 8 a.m. until 5 p.m. when we were done. Throughout the day, there were between 4 and 12 people in line for what was like, I think, nine charger stalls. And people were pretty good about finishing and, and going. And so if you're, but at the same time, if you're sitting there for an hour waiting for your charge and you need that one charge to get you through a week, mm -hmm. I'm getting my 100%. If that means I don't have to do this for one more day, I agree. A hundred, absolutely. I agree. And I would, I personally be conscious of idle fees if there are idle fees, and EA should absolutely be charging idle fees. And the claim that they aren't is based on what someone on Twitter said. I've okay. been charged idle fees before. From EA. I mean, I think that's how you but, create incentive or disincentivize, yeah, right? Yeah. So make an idle fee. You will then train people. To not sit there. I mean, because yeah. right now we have a social construct that's probably been around for decades. If you pull up to a gas pump and you don't get gas and you just go inside to get stuff, people will look at you and be kind of irritated. And yeah. one day you'll do that to get gas and someone will just not, they're not getting gas, they're getting chips. And you're like, well, why didn't they just park in one of the parking spaces or yeah. wait for a parking space? I think this will suss itself out. Uh, suss itself out. Yeah. And like, Almost all electric cars are like, except like press cars, ironically, are connected to your phone. Mm -hmm. So whether it's through the Hyundai app or the Tesla app or the uh, or the Electrify America app, you, you know when your car is done charging. Mm -hmm. And even if you're not connected, like if I use a, a, a public charger where I don't have an account, I can select for it to text me when it's done, you know, like the, even if I don't have the account. So um, – but but uh, it's definitely like I, I don't think we should be like blaming individuals and like venting at individuals for like, you know, charging to 100 or for like, you know, enjoying the things that we've put around the chargers specifically to encourage you to use the chargers, if not financially. I think on the second point, it's just – how long are they enjoying them? Because then you're holding up the charger. Yeah, you know, it's, I think it's there's the getting yourself to 100, percent and then it's going to be a little bit of leeway on the other side of that. But some of the charges they're at like a mall, and if right. you go spend like all the ones two right hours here. in the mall, and now you are holding up a charger. I don't, I don't, uh, you know, I think 
idle fees will we'll solve yeah. that problem. And people will – we will eventually create the behavior that is better for every customer. Yeah. Yeah. But um, – I was arguing that I think that that we've sort of by having these cars with you know by having the term range anxiety that the manufacturers have tried to alleviate by putting ever bigger batteries into their cars mm -hmm. as opposed to infrastructure anxiety which is I know how far I can drive I'm comfortable with that distance I'm not comfortable with what the state of the charger no pun intended, will be when I get there. Will it work? Will there be a line? Will it connect to my car? Will I be able to get the electricity I need to keep going? And so, but some people were saying that there is no correlation between those two things. People do not buy bigger batteries because of the, the, uh, the problems with the charge network, which I, from personal experience, disagree with. Um, I bought the longest range car I could reasonably buy specifically so I could do certain drives without having to do the charge network at all. Wait, is there a theory that people are buying a smaller battery because they know that it, it's hard to charge a larger one? There, and no, therefore they would there charge are some studies that show that people's concerns about EVs, mm -hmm. the, the, the range of the vehicle – is independent is not does not make the top list of concerns, whereas most of their concerns are infrastructure related, not range of the vehicle related. Yeah. That'd be an interesting shift because I think for a long time it felt like this is anecdotal, but the concerns you would see posted in comments, some friendly, some not, were what about the range? What if I want to drive right. 800 miles? And so now maybe that's kind of been solved by large batteries. So people and people have experienced the right. infrastructure, but more. they could have. They could have solved it earlier by positioning it as range anxiety. Well, now whose job is it to solve it, right? Manufacturers, bigger batteries, more range. Mm -hmm. But as opposed to infrastructure anxiety, which could have been set up that way 10 years ago, which would have said, okay, we need more chargers that work more reliably in more accessible places. Yeah. But I think, I think range anxiety is a simpler thing to understand and therefore a simpler headline and 10 years right. ago was the simpler fear. Yeah. Where, wherever that term originated, whether it was from consumers or companies that made ice engines that wanted to, or, or oil industry. I mean, I don't know if, whether it was organic or inorganic. Like, it, was it was not just organic, thing. but I looked up the term on Wikipedia. It is not mm. totally organic. It was used as marketing and, and it was used specifically in a way to market electric vehicles that had more range uh, as it was it was used to market yeah cure, the cure for range anxiety gotcha. yeah but it's not range anxiety it's the it's infrastructure anxiety um first reported in 97 yeah about the EV1 wow yeah yeah yeah, which that might have been actual range anxiety. I think that car went like sixty miles or something. Oh, and GM tried to oh GM tried to trademark it in twenty ten. Yeah, that cat's out of the bag. I think at that point they probably tried to trademark it in twenty ten for the Volt, because the Volt had an ex a range extending extending gas engine. Uh, probably yeah. doesn't say. Wow. Speaking of range extending gas engines, now that my dad really knows how to use his hybrid Cayenne. He like loves it. Oh, really? This is the greatest thing ever. Why? Did, what did he not under, understand? Before? He just didn't like. He didn't understand what the different drive modes do. He didn't really understand that like what sport mode you know really was or did you know because his old one, which was a turbo, it just like had power all the fucking time. So he didn't <laughs> understand that like <laughs> yeah. if he you know he didn't understand like. Okay, he can set it to start every time in pure electric mode and only have the gas engine come on when he runs out of juice. But if he wanted to drive fast, he could click it to sport mode. Like, I just had to, like, teach him how to use it. And once I, like, did, now when I went home, he was like, I haven't bought gas in a month and a half. Like, he was, like, really, really excited. And my mom is trading in her Q5 for the a Q5 hybrid. Oh, and she's, like, really excited about that, too. So, like... People, I think, once you kind of like educate them on these higher end hybrids that are that can act as short range EVs, but where you never have to deal with the charge network, like they're like, oh, this is like great. I can use electricity for my short errands and everyday stuff, and I can, 
deal with gas when I have to drive further. Like, this is awesome. Did they, did they get a charger installed at home or just use they, the 110? No, they have a they, – they got a, a level 2 put into their house. They they had built that house, so they pre-wired it. So it was just a matter of buying the unit and sticking it on the wall. Gotcha. But, yeah. Good financing terms or – <laughs> yeah. On the charge on the chargers, the charger, yeah. yeah. Fucking Amazon, honestly. The same one I have in my house. Wow. Yeah, you buy EV EV chargers on Amazon. Yeah, you can buy Speaking of which, you, you see fucking Kyle Connor got a DC fast charger installed at his house. What? That's crazy. I saw it on his Instagram. How did he get enough power for that? I have no idea, but it must have been so expensive. <laughs> I looked into getting one at WCCS South Bay. And I saw the math on it, and I was like, fucking hell no. Wow. Yeah. I mean, he charges uh, he, he charges a lot of cars. I'm I sure mean, it was a business write-off, but that is wild. Yeah, I, 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 I'm sure it is a – there is some funny business – not funny business. That's the wrong word. I'm sure there's a, a creative – it's not even have to be that creative. Their business is electric cars, so I'm sure it's fully tax deductible, and there might even be – some kind of incentives, I don't know, but like, that's pretty nuts. That's I've, pretty nuts. I've never heard of actually anybody doing that uh, at their house. I mean, that's yeah, that's crazy. It's very advantageous for him. You know, the amount of content he makes with EVs. If you want to bring them home, charge it, and then go out and do a shoot. Yeah, you don't have to. You know, that saves you a lot of time. But wow. that's how bad wow. the public network is. That it's worth it to put your own one of these in your in your house. Uh, maybe depends on how far away he lives from a real charger, but it's pretty nuts. I wonder. I I would like to know. Kyle, let us know in the comments. Um, like, did you have to get wiring installed? Do you have to oh run, yeah, like, dig up the street? Yeah, I mean, you can't you just like put hands. that on a house. No, of course not. Yeah. So I, I'm wondering how complicated that process was. Holy, it's moly. Cr that's crazy, right? Yeah. Be funny if it's just on a huge diesel generator. That would. Be <laughs> <laughs> like so many of them are. Um, so speaking of things that are uh, crazy, remember uh, when I uh, said um, <laughs> Donnie calls me? He goes like, "All right, I got I got the rest of your parts uh, list together. Couldn't get them in Arizona from the normal sources. Have to go to Italy. Have to get them from Italy. New old stock Lamborghini." Okay. Do you get invoiced for the flights to Italy, or is he no, going anywhere? No, not di not directly, but I'm sure it's in there somewhere. Okay. And he's going to Italy for for a couple people's cars and to do some like other things. Like, right. Okay. But one way or another, I'm, I also needed a new card reader, which is in Italy. <laughs> so one way or another, see that I'm on the probably Amex. paying for this flight. All right. But it's not a line item. Okay. Um. And he goes, "I'm going to send you all the parts that we need." And he sends me a list that's six pages long. And I go, "Okay." And he goes, "This is it. I promise. This is all the parts you need to finish the car." I go, "Okay." He goes, but I need you to, to send the wire so I can get them. So it's he, he needs to – he puts in the order. Then he goes to Italy to check the order and make sure everything's right and before it's shipped home. Okay. Because there's a lot of different stuff. Right. And let's just say the Italians aren't known for their fucking – Precision. Accuracy when it comes to mm -hmm. the sending the right stuff. I go, okay, how much do you need? $36,750. <laughs> on top of what's been spent I've already? already. Sp on parts, 13000 so far. So we're looking at 49000 Let's say so 50. Let's let's, just call what are you it, doing? Let's just call it 50 yeah. in parts. That's 50. 50 in parts. In parts? M yeah. And almost all of it, almost all of the parts are suspension related. How many suspension parts are there? I've a seen the underside lot. of that car. All those, all those uh, Heim joints yeah. are crazy expensive. Every bolt is like eight dollars. I mean, it's but like everything you can imagine like in, on an individual bolts. level is so much bolts. more expensive than you could imagine it being. Oh, my. wait! When we were there last time, yes, and he had oh. all those, and he had all those parts. Yeah. Okay, that's from the thirteen K. Okay. Most of that stuff. But but that didn't include the big ticket items. We needed. Remember, there was a bent control arm. Yeah, I thought we they need, straight. No, they couldn't straighten. Couldn't it. straighten it. Need right. a new one. How much is a control arm? Don't know. A lot. A lot. A ton. It's got to be four figures. There's there's like we needed all the new um, 
all the new like ignition stuff, um, the new brake hardware was really expensive. The brake stainless steel brake lines were really expensive. The parts list is really long. I mean, there's probably like a couple hundred items on the parts list, most of which are just like little bolts and bullshit. But like, is it new old stock? Yes. Or is it, okay. It's new old stock. Okay. So it's, which is why it's so why, expensive because yeah. where the fuck else are you going to go? Nobody makes parts for this car. Well, I mean, you could get bolts that would work probably. Yeah. Yeah. But, but it's like, not... as we've learned, that's how we ended up here because mm. someone for 20 years, they just bought like whatever worked. They didn't buy. The one that Lamborghini designed to work. Right. That's how we learned this with the Ferrari, too. Same shit. It's just the car. When you do all this stuff, the car ends up working so much better. Uh, yeah. I, I feel like there are some things like control arm. Absolutely. You know, uh, ignition stuff. I have. Absolutely. Hang on. Hold, when it's hold, a bolt. I'll, I'll get. Hang on. I mean, my phone is in the other room. I'll get I'll get the list. Because we'll because Fastenal has a very deep catalog of hardware, of varying strengths, densities, threads, lengths. And I was warned. <laughs> I was. I was warned. Remember when Aaron Robinson wrote that article for um, Haggerty about Kuntosh restoration? And yep. the, the guy from Colorado, who's the expert, um, you know, said, uh, he said, you know, if you need uh, the, uh, the this and the that, uh, the, the bills rain down like hellfire. <laughs> um, well, this is fucking. This is all. You know what? I didn't look at it that carefully. Wow, it's all in Italian. So I actually don't. Barac, Baracolio. I, I don't. This shit's all in Italian. Oh, okay. I I will have to ask Donnie to send me some kind of a translation. I just looked at the, the Google Translate. App I looked camera. at the total number, wow. but like. Yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of stuff. Quantity 16. What is this? Uni. Bacola Snowdo Uniball. That's got to be a heim joint. Uniball. Let me see. B O. Wait, wait. B O C C O L A. Uh huh. S N O D O. Yeah, space. S N O D O U N I B A L. Joint pushing. Yeah. So 16 joint bushings. How many numbers are after that? It, uh, how many are 16? Like how, much, how much does that cost for 16 joint bushings? Uh, it doesn't really say. He didn't, he doesn't, he didn't really say. Okay. Wow. This is like a weird, it's a weird screenshot. Um, so you're, you're getting all new running gear. Yeah. Jeez. So, I mean, but then there's like other stuff where it's like quantity 10, quantity 10, quantity 4, quantity 8. Here's three items that are all quantity 10, quantity 10, quantity 10. Like, so it's all just like little bits. Here's quantity 20, quantity 20, quantity 10, quantity 10. So like little bolts and shims and bits of hardware that they're just fucking charging you, you know, who knows how much for um, I'll I'll come back with a I'll I'll ask for the itemized list so that we can yeah. get fucking content about that. Look for the fourth WCCS location to be opening very soon. I mean I I I knew this like literally I <laughs> I, I knew it was going to be bad and actually and Donnie swears to me that this is all of the parts I need and so we have to pay the machine shop for my heads for doing the valve work mm -hmm. and. He said, we're going to have to buy new rings, piston rings, um, and gaskets. But he said, the rings and gaskets are standard. They're nothing special. We can just buy those. Um, the gaskets, the head, ga uh, the, the head and valve cover gaskets, but they're not expensive. But he said, like, after this, this giant order of parts, the car goes back together again. Um, does it, did a commenter have something interesting yeah, to add? Yeah, good point. 50000 is only 7% of its value, which no, is yeah, rough it is. math. And, yeah. and honestly, with the labor and shit, it'll probably be knocking on the door of 70. But bought the car for 260 it's worth 700 today. So, like, still a good investment. That's true. And I yeah. drove it for four years only doing oil point. changes. So, like, this is worthwhile. Yeah. And, and th this isn't, like, a regular service. This is a combination of 
replacing all the rubber and shit that's been on there since 1987. So it's we're talking once every 25. It's probably once every 20, 25 years. But this car has been 35 years. You know what I mean? So yeah, I'm talking 25 years plus the unfucking of what the last three owners Mickey Mouse. Right. You the know, weird wires and just USB yeah, and just yeah. all you know, like this is the put it back to stock, and also we're doing the 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 euro conversion, so we're we're it's it's not going carbed, it's still injected, but there's a lot of stuff that was put on there for U.S. that this that didn't work anyway. I have ten years of records of this car trying to pass smog and failing. None of this shit worked. So fucking get rid of it. What's the point? Stupid, and so. It's the Euro stuff, it's the unfucking, and it's the replacing all the tired rubber with all brand new rubber. And we're at a point right now in this car's history where all of these cars will start to need this if they mm -hmm. haven't already, regardless of miles. And, um, and but, but it's not at a point where there's a bunch of aftermarket companies supporting it. Right. When I saw John Tamarian at Pebble Beach and I was talking about this stuff with him uh, from Curated, they do a lot of Countach stuff. And he's like, he, he, was, he, he gave me the most exasperated look and he goes, dude, I have been saying to Lamborghini for years to do a box. I, here's everything you need, suspension refresh box. And it'll cost $35,000, but you write one check, you buy it in one place, and you know you're getting the right stuff. He goes, how, how hard would that be to put, because everyone needs all of it. Yeah. No one does this shit piecemeal. Right. You how just, many Countaches did they make? 2,000. Okay. And, and which is not, a, and they're all different. Right. Uh, you know, they're the, the 400 is different from the S, is different from the QV, is different from the anniversary. So it's but but they all will need this they will. most of them are still on the road but if this is new old stock there's probably limited there's you know the question is is there enough new old stock to refresh 2000 cars no probably not so there you yeah, so and some of them will tough. never get it some of them have delivery you know there's some that have been collections that have no miles and they'll never get it no one right. gives a shit yeah. and there's others that'll need it multiple times cuz they get driven Doug said his car is probably you know he bought that a beautiful Countach, but it's got a bunch of miles on it. I think it's like, I think it's got sixty thousand kilometers on it, which is great, perfect for him. And and he, he bought an awesome car, but he said his car had a fucking bill, a service receipt in it for a hundred thousand dollars from like two thousand and four. And so he said, you know, in in three or four years, his car might need this too. So. Um, I'm going to see him this weekend at uh, Cars and Coffee Rancho Santa Fe and and, and check it out. But, um, but but it would it would be nice if we didn't have to do all the shit Donnie had to do to just get these parts. If you right. could just call right, Lambo right, right. Classic Center and go suspension refresh kit eighty eight QV. Does anyone do that? Do any companies do that for you know, oh, yeah. really vintage cars? Yeah, yeah. Mercedes Classic Center, Porsche mm. Classic. You can get stuff like that, yeah. But the the Countach stuff, because of the Heim joints, because it's such a – it real, it's not like the 328, which is an, a nice car, but built of mostly normal parts. Super quick tangent that's related. The ignition switch Sam needed for his 1972-2002 uh -huh. TII is the same switch that we used that was used on the 328, yeah. F40, and F50. Yeah. So I mean, it, it's, it's all stuff. it's all Bosch it shit. Is. Like, and and the 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 actually the ignition, the Bosch K Jetronic in the Countach is the same as anything else, and that that's very simple, and that works good. We don't have to replace that. Thank God. Just take out the mystery box that was in the wired into it. And honestly, I mean, you know, yes, it's a big number, but one that's relative to the value of the vehicle. Yeah, like yeah. even with because you've done other repairs on this before, right? Uh, the distributor. We had to do the distributor, that. which is which we don't have to do now because it was just done. So, so let's even if you've in so you for had to go 80, to Italy to get a distributor. I remember that. <laughs> even if you're in for eighty, yeah, yeah, your total is in for three fifty, and you've doubled your money. It's a rare. It's a rare. Opportunity to actually have a car investment mm -hmm. pay off, even with some headaches. Yeah, and but it proves the the if I get it back and it works great, and I just start fucking driving the shit out of it. 
the miles will be cheap. Totally. Because it just it's so rare, it doesn't matter. And it's a good highlight of why, for a while, when the values are down, yeah. repairing these things properly is not worth it. Because when the cars were worth 100 yeah. and they're like, here's your $70,000 repair bill, yeah. you're like, fuck. You I understand why zero. they got Mickey Mouse. Yeah. Unless you can keep it long enough, it, it, it should have been obvious that these cars would be worth a lot of money. And a savvy... A savvy owner at the time, which Doug's Doug's car, that guy owned that car from like ninety two to twenty twenty. Oh, okay. And then it went to Smart. a dealer. Like yeah. that guy, that's the perfect owner because that guy probably would have done it right the whole time, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. And so, like, he wrote a hundred thousand dollar restoration bill at a, at a at a time when the car was probably worth one hundred and five. Wow. You know? Yeah. So it, it, if you find a car that's had one owner through that lull, you're in great shape. And as opposed to having three or four different owners during that period, which is what my car was. And so that's what, how we're ending up there now. But when it's done, it's going to be it's going to be so good. I won't even expect I understand. I mean, remember Harry at Goodwood? Mm -hmm. And he was like, yeah, when I got it back, it's like a, a totally different. Yeah, and you you need to do a comparo with Doug, like side by side mm -hmm. driving, of course, to see if you can feel the difference. Different cars, which we will do. Just, We've yeah. talked about doing it, but like even the the Ferrari before and after was like, oh, this is what it's supposed to be. Like, oh, all right, this this yeah. all makes sense now. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> and he goes, yeah, you got to send the wire. It's thirty six seven. I'm like, fuck. That's why it made sense where I could have paid him in units of Bentley. <laughs> Mm -hmm. John, John wanted fucking 35 grand for that car. I could have bought the Bentley and just handed the title over to Donnie and still owed him more money. Yeah, and you still have to owe him for labor. <laughs> just insane. But, like, when he gets back from this trip, it's going the other way. The parts are going to go back in the car. Yes, that As is a, where they're supposed to go. It's going back in the car. So That's cool. Whew, when he sent that number, boy. Yikes. Right. And, and then you had to start doing the same math the commenters are doing. You're like, okay, it's worth it. It's worth it. Yeah. It's worth it. Yeah. And Hannah was like, came back from trip and she's like, she's like, don't get mad. And I'm like, at what? And she's like, I, I bought a bunch of vintage toys on eBay. And I'm like, how much did you spend? And she told me, and I was like, <laughs> don't even fuck, forget it. Did buy, she spend hundreds buy of what, dollars? Yeah, hundreds yeah. of dollars. Buy whatever fucking vintage toys you did want. Did you tell her about this yet? That I've been buying new old stock Lamborghini <laughs> bushings. Yeah, I told her. You have a control arm that costs more than all the toys she bought. I told her, and she was just like, oh, my God. <laughs> it's like, there's something wrong with you. She's all right. She didn't care. She, 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 knows, she, she knows that I kind of know what I'm doing. Right. But like it's one of those funny things though, you're like, it's worth it if I ever sold the car, which I won't. Yeah. But if I do, I'll get the money back, yeah. which I won't because I won't sell it. I told my dad when we were on the drive and he's like, okay, explain the math of this car again to me. This is I need to and I did it out. He's like, Yeah, well okay. It's not it's not bad. It's not bad. <laughs> if you're ever in a pinch, you'll be up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not bad. And it's insured. I mean, it's in, it's agreed value insurance. So if something happens, you know, you get your money back. Mm -hmm. But um, <laughs> yeah, I got that. I was like, oh, should have should have just said Donnie the Bedley. <laughs> that would have been that would have that would have been it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So anyway, uh, make sure to uh, go and uh, donate blood plasma. Mm. Uh, sign up for be the match. Uh, we've got the giveaway. It ends December first of the the notice watch. Uh, my one of one uh, piece unique prototype watch. The winner will be flown uh, to LA to collect it from me. We'll hit the canyons in one of my cars. It'll be a whole thing. Um, and uh, the orange dial, the new the new release that we're doing uh, for the Notice Canyon. That's going to be January one. A hundred units will get allocated to Patreon first. And 100 units will be allocated to the public because the public got kind of mad. Not – not, I mean like two people bitched. But like the notice – the notice, they have their own fans. Mm -hmm. And they were like, wait, we can't buy them. And so we're doing 200. That makes sense. And 100 of them uh, will go to the patrons first and then – the other hundred will go to notices people first, but um, still individually numbered, um, still coming with the two straps, the under the cuff two piece NATO, and uh, same price, twelve hundred bucks. So that's coming. But uh, if you want to enter to win the one of one prototype, um, 
and come collect it from me in person. Uh, that is ending December 1. So you still have time to donate blood or plasma uh, or stem cells. You still have time to sign up for Be The Match. Um, so go to our, my Instagram. The, um, the post is pinned. It's the only, the only pinned post. So you can see all the, uh, the game rules to enter there. And uh, I, hope, uh, I hope somebody really wants it and fucking wins it. And we've gotten a lot of emails. Um, the email is peaceunique at thesmokingtire.com to send your entry stuff to. We've gotten a bunch of entries. But not so many that if you enter, you still don't have a good chance. of. There's been more than 100 and less than 200 uh, entries. But um, um, anyway, so let's go to the Patreon. Um, uh, of course, if you want to ask us questions on the show, if you want to listen live, if you want to get an ad-free experience, patreon.com slash the smoking tire podcast. The best website in the world. <laughs> we have a lot of questions. We will get through as many as we can. Um, let's see what's going on. David Bodenstein says, I have a 2013 um, Boss 302 Mustang with 100,000 miles. Still enjoy the car a lot, but it's starting to show, it, show its age. Should I improve it with better suspension, maybe gearbox change? Oh, Maybe F oh forced induction FI, or sell it and or and spring for a new automotive experience. What transmission does that car have? The Getrag. Oh, it's not the mm. Tremec. Um. So I look. I think the the real question is that we can't answer for you. Is do you love it enough that if you made some tweaks? your love would be renewed? Or mm -hmm. do you want a new experience? Um, so I, I can't really tell you that. I think that you could certainly renew the vibe with some mods. I mean, people do that all the time, and it is a successful strategy. When I had my Corvette, it was stock for like four or five years, and then I did suspension, brakes, wheels and tires, and some engine mods, and it felt like a totally different car, and I got, like, 10 more years of enjoyment out of it. Yeah. So I like, think I, – I don't think changing the, the transmission would, for me, change the character of the car. But the suspension is 10 years old. So, yeah. I mean, even if it's not tired, suspension technology has moved forward a lot in 10 years. So yeah. you might find some really – Good stuff out there that will make it ride softer and be better on the track. Or if you want to make it more track focused, you could you could change the character of it pretty significantly with some good suspension stuff and a really good alignment or lighter wheels, better yeah. brakes, all of those things. Force induction would, of course, I wouldn't make it feel different, but I would. Yeah, I've the never been so in any GT based car that was improved with a blower. Most the, of them the are worse. So good, and the car so balanced and even. Yeah, and yeah. It, it just start, it always feels heavier up front with force induction, and, and it, it never uh, really feels like it like. makes the power they advertise too. They heat True. soak fast. It's just they, there's a lot of like drivetrain loss in those. Yeah, it might be. It's not, they've never been great. I would I'd keep it keep it NA, but you could definitely refresh your suspension, maybe with a nice set of shocks and and a lightweight set of wheels and good tires, and and that'll get you a different feel for mm -hmm. sure. Uh, Ivan said, my question is about brands that, ha that have been more than what people think of them. Uh, that's a bit worded strange. Usually we see brands like Maserati falling off their prestige, but which oh. ones have had an increased rep in the last decade? I would say Hyundai, for oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, Hyundais in the 90s and 2000s were like kind of a joke, but now they make very nice cars that in many cases are considered to be luxury cars. Yeah, the interiors are amazing. And I think their exterior design, I think they've been hitting it out of the park f with the exception of like the Elantra, the mm -hmm. new newest one. Cars are so good looking. And Genesis, mm -hmm. you know, the, the offshoot. Mm -hmm. So I think they do great, great work. Uh, Gunner says, if I could sit down and talk watches with anyone for an hour or two, who would it be? Interesting um, question. I'm doing a panel with Grand Seiko next week. And... And I am definitely the low end of the totem pole. Kevin O'Leary uh, from Shark Tank is on it. Kelly Yock, who is the head of um, 
of concierge shopping for watches of Switzerland is there. Uh, this guy, uh, Gary Steingart, who is an amazing author and cultural critic and is a great follow on Instagram, he's on it. One of the Hodinkee guys is on it, and then it's me. <laughs> and um, it's actually really funny. They sent out the bios of everybody to the attendees, and we were asked to submit our own bios. And my bio is the one I use for Road and Track magazine, which specifically has to be under 200 words to fit in the byline of the fucking magazine, right? Mm -hmm. So it's got to be short. So I just copied and pasted that. I didn't think about much of it. So mine is like this big. Kevin O'Leary's is like a page and a half. <laughs> Jeez, that's that's too much. That's just like a you need little, an editor. A little overwhelming. Does he mention FTX anywhere in that book? I don't Probably know, not. but uh, but that's that's going to be the for the Grand Seiko GS9 Club. So that'll be an interesting chat. I mean, who would I like to sit down and talk about watches with? I, um, like Roger W. Smith, who is like one of the most amazing watchmakers in the world. Uh, he has a he, he only he doesn't have a staff. It's just him. Every watch he makes by himself, his his studio is on the Isle of Man, Whoa. and his watches are they're all a million dollars. Um, the Roger W. Smith, um, he was the apprentice of a guy named George Daniels, and George Daniels invented the coaxial escapement and was like one of the most important watchmakers in watchmaking history. Um, and this guy was his apprentice and now has his own thing going and everything he makes is crazy expensive and crazy finished. And it's like a little formal for my taste, but mm -hmm. like in terms of collectability and historical significance, it's fucking G. Makes his own movements and everything. Everything. Makes, on his website, makes, yeah. He makes not just his own movements, but every part of every movement he makes. Jeez. Or Jay-Z. I like to sit down and talk Very watches cool. with Jay-Z and cars. Jay-Z buys awesome cars. He's got a Lambo LM002. He's got a Pagoda Mercedes. He buys dope shit. Man, like Jay-Z, real... we know you're listening. Come on the show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Kevin McCann is looking to add a Mustang to his stable. Uh, should I get a 35, for 35 grand, should he get a 2013 Boss 302 or a 2019 GT PP2, same miles and condition, what would be better for two to three track days per year and is most likely to retain its value? Well, he could buy Ivan's 2013. He should buy Ivan's. That's pretty funny. Yeah. Well, I think in the short term, the, the Boss may have bottomed out, so that might retain its value, whereas the 19 may still be dropping. But the 19... It's going to be a stiffer chassis. It's Independent a newer car. rear suspension. IRS. I mean, that's going to be the better car overall. Plus, the interior was way better. I yeah. Think. I mean, it, it just – the 2013, it looks dated. It had the old green letters on everything. Yeah. It just doesn't look as good. Um, I really like the PP2. The bosses are pretty rare. I don't see them a lot now. Um, but – and if you, you want to – I mean – I think the boss is probably more likely to retain its value, but the the GT PP2 is the one I'd rather be driving. Um, so, uh, yeah. May says, uh, suggestions for fun, fairly cheap miles after spending 50000 I had an E92 M3 that only cost me about six Gs over three years, which is like 170 bucks a month. What else is close to its depreciation floor that I can drive for a few years and get out of for around the same money? Um, C6 Corvette ZR1s, unbelievable value for money. Um, 65, 70 grand. I mean, and they'll, the they'll all, and they'll always have a ton of value, and they're so fast. Th those and, put all the force induction to the ground, yeah. unlike the Mustangs. Holy! And moly. the later ones have great seats too. Even, even, even they once they change the seat to the like anniversary edition or whatever, fifty may be a little low, but it'll get you a great C6 Z06 that will hold its value as well. Or maybe a Grand Sport. Yeah, Grand Sport C7 really Grand nice Sport, one. really nice. I mean, you can now get. Um, Solid nine, a great, great, great 996 C4S, uh, a decent 996 Turbo, or a pretty good 997 Carrera S for 50 grand, all of which you can drive and enjoy. I feel like a 996 Turbo, I feel like that would be a really stable yeah. investment. Yeah, great right? cars. Yeah, there's a floor. Amazing. I mean, there's yeah. they're never going to be worth less than 45,000 bucks ever. Um, 
Uh, and he says, not looking for an oh, Elise. Sorry. Oh, so that's all right. Maybe an Avora S or an Avora uh, 400. You probably would have to spend a little more money on an Avora, but but they have a floor as well. Um, but yeah, the high-end Corvettes from a couple of years ago um, or 996, 997 generation Porsches are a great place to start. Um, okay. Uh, Prashan suggests that... Uh, he is his friend had a passing interest in cars and says he likes smaller SUVs. When I asked what he meant, he pointed to a GLE coupe. He was surprised when I told him that they are the same size as a standard GLE. I think these coupe SUVs are popular because people literally think they are smaller. I see twice as many coupes as regular GLEs in Chicago. And they look they they look smaller. The back looks smaller. It looks like a more trim felt yeah. vehicle even though the wheelbase and the width and all that stuff we know is the same yeah uh i don't think, I think that's why they're popular i think they're popular because people think they they're sporty they look sporty yeah they look cool and tough and we've yeah. said before they've taken the place of the large wheelbase grand touring two-door coupe like mm -hmm. they've taken the m8 market yeah yeah um but that's an interesting thought uh Let's see. David says, I'm looking at 981 Boxers and Caymans. I have a $70,000 budget. Anything to be wary of when it comes to maintenance or things breaking, or are they pretty stout? Uh, over revs, which you can check with a DME report to make sure the tr clutch and trans haven't been smoked. I just learned from Byron Bowers, who I saw at Good Vibes, that you can actually, even if the car is a Tiptronic, uh, it can record uh, level one over revs. Level one, so there's six levels of okay. over revs, um, and level one is like hitting the rev limiter in a, in a gear without over revving it, and even level two is like really hitting the red line hard. Like if you first gear red line, full throttle, slam the rev limiter. That's okay. like one and two, three, four, five, six is actual mechanical over revs, like money shifting. Okay. Yeah. And so if you've got a DME report, which you can download from Porsche uh, through the car, not from like the website, um, level one, level two over revs are not true over revs. Uh, uh, and then three, three through six are where you got to be a little nervous. And so you want the DME report and you, you want as few actual mechanical over revs as possible so that's that's something but in general they're they're pretty stout um especially by the time the 981 is the the previous gen it's not the ones that had the ims issues and stuff but like they're all right not I, as far as i know um okay uh alex garcia says I've been living in New York City the last five years and love it. I get by easily with no car and can walk and bike almost anywhere, but it's tough to be a car enthusiast unless you're very wealthy. True. Uh, what are the upsides besides just car culture of moving to L.A. compared to New York and anything you miss about living in New York? Um, so, I mean, sunshine, <laughs> lots of it all year. Mm -hmm. um, Close access to mountains. National parks, state parks, all that stuff. There's a lot more of them around here, aren't there? Yeah, and there's a bigger spread. Like, it's the same distance to go skiing from New York City to the mountains as it is from where we are in L.A. to the mountains. But there's an actual beach also, like a real one. And just the outdoor lifestyle that L.A. has is more so than New York. But I do miss certain things about New York. When I got to New York last week... Even when I before I had left JFK Airport, the the like the attitude of people moving through the airport oh, was yeah. so much different in New York that I was like, oh yeah, this is what's up. And I think people have a little more to say in New York. Like people are just a little more in tune with the world around them. Hmm. Celebrity culture means less. Um, I think I think my conversations that I have with people in New York are typically a little more interesting and deep. Um, and there's a, the few foods that New York still has that LA doesn't have that are <clears throat> very, very good. And like the, like the suburbs, like, I mean, not New York city, but the, where my parents live in Greenwich, every drive was pleasant. 
because they're all just through these winding woods and even just going to the grocery store or going to meet my friend for dinner, you know, I, from the time I pull out of the house until the time I get there, like I'm moving. Whereas coming from here, it's light to light and stuff like that. So you also get that like green exposure. Yeah. Like the fact you're in a forest, which they've proven relaxes us. Whereas yeah. here you're driving in concrete. Yeah. So uh, that's that's nice. But I don't regret coming here. I think it, it's it's for for my business. It's it's great, and I do love the sunshine and, and a lot of things. Quick shot fired towards uh, New York. I had my favorite breakfast sandwich ever in Knoxville at this mm. amazing place called Potchkey's. I don't know if you're going there oh. when you go to yeah. Knoxville or in your trip. Uh huh. But started by a really great baker. Her boyfriend is now also is also a great baker at some highfalutin restaurant. So like they joined forces. But um, that was my favorite breakfast sandwich I've ever had. Really? Yeah. What made it that way? The bread it was on looked like a bagel, but was actually super soft huh. and like pillowy. And then it was a frittata instead of just an egg. So uh, that had its own. And there were a ton of fresh herbs in there. And then a nice. weird like bell pepper chutney. All these crazy uh, flavors bounced. It was fantastic. Oh, cool. I went t- two days in a row. Really? It was so good. Yeah. I resisted both the bacon, egg, and cheese and the sunrise pizza when I was in New York. And I was kind of proud of myself for doing that. Mm-hmm. But I almost, I regret it a little bit because, oh, it's so funny. I miss a New York bacon, egg, and cheese, salt, pepper, ketchup. Just can't fucking beat it. First person to do that shit in L.A. is going to make a ton of fucking money. Um, I don't – Aiden, I'd love to answer your question, but I just don't fucking know. What's, what state have the best and worst license plate designs? I So many different designs from so many different states. It's true. The now best is – the California black plate is awesome. Black, yellow letters – Tough looking. Colorado like now that. has black with white letters. Oh, okay. Which is slightly, which is yeah. a more neutral color, I guess. But I, color, I but couldn't, yeah. I couldn't tell you half, you know. Um, Aaron, I, I don't have an answer for Aaron's question. He's looking at a 2014 Fiesta ST with 85,000 miles. What should I be looking out for? What did you need to fix on yours? I don't know. We bought ours new, sold it with 30,000 miles on it. Didn't need anything. Mm-hmm. I mean, nothing broke. This so. is a question. Uh, go to the forums because yeah. there's probably been other people that were curious about the same thing. And that's where you will find the bad stories and the true stories and the stuff. Because we get cars when they're new or own them when they're fairly new. Yeah. But the long-term ownership stuff, you want to look at the forums. I can tell you what to look out for in a Lamborghini Countach. Right. If you're looking out for that or a 328 Ferrari. Um, but yeah, I bought my Fiesta new and, and I never had any problems with it. You might want to talk to Johnny Lieberman, who will be here tomorrow, actually. Mm-hmm. And, and he had one for longer and had to do some things. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, James Kaminsky uh, looking to buy a midsize pickup or a crossover as a daily. Would it be a Chevy Colorado or a Chevy Traverse or Blazer? What would both of you do? Uh, if I buy a crossover, I'll buy a small utility trailer as I do yard work a few times a year that require a bed. Uh, I also tow a 23-foot pontoon boat. Uh, the tra- I can store the trailer at home, but I have to sacrifice parking my car inside my garage because the HOA doesn't allow it. Okay, you live in Michigan. Uh, I mean, I would say that if you can get the pickup and get a cap on it, that'll cover you. Because it's having the trailer seems kind of annoying. True. You would otherwise use the garage space for stuff. If you get a quad cab pickup and you have a cap on it, then it'll put you in the same kind of place as a... I was actually going to go the other way, but I will add it depends on if James has kids or not. Because I hate... Pickup trucks, you can't lock anything in the bed. Right. If you have a cab, over, if you have a cap, it yeah, does help, could. but then things slide around a lot depending right. on how big they are. You need like you need some sort of organizational system. Right. Whereas a crossover, it's just easier to manage things that are locked in there. Because uh, right. I don't think doing odd jobs four times a year justifies a pickup. But you know, and if the towing ratings for each vehicle are even, but I do agree, losing your garage to a trailer would feels redundant somehow so yeah if you have if you have a lot of family i'd want to have the crossover so i can keep the back seats free right but if you have two people you can lock shit in the back seat of the pickup truck right i yeah I, i'd probably go with the colorado and the cap but but uh but i feel you uh bad gardener says what are the biggest differences of opinion that you have in the automotive world 
And so, uh, someone brought up pop-up headlights, which I do think are stupid. I don't like pop-up I think pop headlights. Up, I don't like pop-up headlights either. Oh. They're a, they're a, they're a necessary evil to the Lamborghini Countach, but I'm not. Yeah. I, I don't like pop-up. Some people are. I such took them out of my Corvette. Remember? That's right. Because some people think they're a great design that should come yeah. back. And I go, what? What? You want to yeah. drop your efficiency and ruin the lines of the car all at once? Yeah. At and, nighttime. And my Ferrari gets noticeable front end lift if I drive fast at night with the headlights up. My Miata uh, top speed would drop by eight miles per hour. <laughs> yeah. uh, do we have a lot of other differences of opinion? I think we've talked about this once before. It was like, I you like old less muscle angry. cars, you don't. You get less angry than me at things. That's been new in the last five years. <laughs> um, I've gotten more relaxed. Uh, I used to get more angry. Yeah. Uh, Dante said, did you see T-Pain and Hertz uh, baby got brap video about rotaries? I did see that, and it is funny. And Hurt has uh, got a new job Shout working out to with T-Pain. He's president and co-founder of uh, Nappy Matt, Boy Automotive. Which I don't know what they do yet other than drift cars, on it, but that sounds awesome. I Whatever they do, it'll be fun. He I'm said sure. they're going to do events and content and all oh, kinds cool. of stuff. But yeah, he, they announced that at Grid Life Laguna. Man, I had FOMO for Grid Life Laguna. Like, it did I, look I went nice. on a good trip too, but... They're just train drifting the corkscrew yeah. with unlimited noise on Saturday. It, it did look like a good time. Yeah. I, uh, I'm, I'm sure that was fun. I was I had to be somewhere else for work, but I, I was invited to go, but um, it did look fun. But the question Dante has is what okay. car-related songs have influenced popular culture? Um, I mean, pop culture. I mean, Little Red Corvette. I don't know how far back do you want to go. Well, that's Yeah, you could do that. Uh, you could also do like any number of... Uh, of hip hop song, I mean, Low Riders, you know, Let Me Ride. Uh, you could talk about fucking Vanilla Ice rolling in his 5.0. You could talk about. Um, I think the Low Rider song is the most influential because you hear it in movie scores all the time yeah. still. Oh, literally, War Low Rider. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. It like sets a mood. It's in movies uh -huh. frequently, whereas the other ones usually aren't. Mm hmm. Uh, I Can't Drive 55, Sammy Hagar. Mm -hmm. um, Shout out to Hot Rod Lincoln. I like that song. It tells <laughs> yeah. a whole story. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I Can't Drive 55 was literally a like a political song. Like it was the national double nickel speed limit. It's, it's, it was protesting that. Um, Metallica, Fuel which is not a great song, but True. has really stuck around. They play it at, like, every single show. Oh, they do? Yeah. Wow, all right. Um, it's one of the best ones from their recent album. It's the albums. only good song yeah. on the Reload album, yeah. for sure. Uh, That's funny. What else was is on there? That's a, It's a tough one to come up with. That's a pretty good list. There's a lot of fucking rap, a lot, that's about cars. Oh, Rihanna, Shut Up and Drive. I forgot about that. I mean, that was just catchy. Oh, yeah. Beatles drive my car. Yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah, some good ones. Uh, Paul said, would it be sensible to swap a 4,000-mile Ferrari 575 Super America F1 for a 991 Porsche Speedster? I want something special but a bit more refined than the 575. I, I wouldn't necessarily call the Speedster that much more refined. I mean, that's a, that's a yeah. GT3 with a cut windshield and and a low top. So yeah, it will feel more raw. It'll be it louder, might, it might feel a little more raw. Yeah, I might I might say swap the 575 Super America for like maybe like an F12 Ferrari or a even a even a 458 maybe, 458 coupe or a 488 coupe. Um or maybe a like a 991 Turbo S. That would be that. probably where I'm at. But I think you'd find that the 991 Speedster would be more raw yeah. than the Ferrari. Good soup, good choice in the Super America, though. Those are cool. Um, <laughs> oh, man. Murray says, I spent the weekend in Vegas for the When We Were Young Festival, uh, which is, uh, and I realized I was not in my 20s anymore as my lower back, feet, and knees were killing me. Uh, what's your strategy for surviving a music festival? Wearing chucks was probably a bad idea. Terrible shoes. Did I talk on the show about, I did talk yeah. about my yeah, fucking yeah. numb thigh. Yeah. Still numb. I now it's have like to. like two weeks. I, I know. I now I have to call Dr. Watkins. Whoa. Yeah. My Pete, my Santo, my fucking PT guy was like, 
I think you might need to call the neurologist yeah. now. Yeah, you I should. I think it's time. Yeah. But my strategy wasn't fucking any better than Murray's. I mean, new balances with orthotics. But besides that, I it's was just, pretty fucked. That's a lot of standing. I was a lot I was going to go to that thing, yeah. that show in Vegas. Um, I mean, I think even if you, I don't know, we'd have to ask someone who's like a marathon runner yeah. at 40. Can you stand still for six hours? Totally. That's hard. Totally. It's hard on your body. Uh, Jeremy Martin says, have you ever crossed paths with John Davis? I never have. That's the Motor Week guy. Right. I never. He lives in like the Midwest somewhere and doesn't yeah. go to things that I go to. So. Well, they have I'd a team to... now. I, I was a, uh, one of my driving partners on something was on the MotorWeek team, and he was like 25. Yeah. So they have other people making content now, and they they work with John Davis. But they were, I think they're in, like, Maryland or something. Yeah. It's fall. Uh, three more. Uh, Tough Odes wants to know on the uh, – about my family's Lexuses, Lexus RXs. At one point, we had five. Uh, we are down to a single RX. There's only one left. Um do you my guys sister, need money? Yeah. I, I can help. My sister's husband, my, my brother-in-law, drives it now. It's the 09. What color is it? Gray. It's mm -hmm. the last one. It was in South Carolina for a while. It's now back. It's got 140,000 miles on it. And um, it uh, it's fine. He's driving it with his with their kids now. Like, But, uh, yeah, the, they, they, were, they were slowly given away to members of my family. My little cousin got one. My other cousin got one. Um, actually, my parents' housekeeper ended up with one. Um, and uh, one was uh, traded in for the Highlander that my parents now have at, and at their vacation house. They have a like a 2019 Highlander or something. And, uh, and then my, my brother-in-law drives one. And so uh, my, they, Lexus lost my mom. The mouse... The, the mouse was where they lost her, and she went Audi and has never uh, looked back from that. And my dad likes the Highlander because it's basically the same as the RX, but has a lot more front seat room. Mm, okay. Yeah. That car's got a ton of space in it, 2019 Highlander. They're kind of big. Ton, they're big, yeah. yeah. Three row, but like just tons of front leg room. Sean Finney, thoughts on a... 997.1 with an LS3 swap at $40,000. Cool or sacrilege? Both. I mean, if the engine blew up, I mean, and it's fun to drive, I don't know. Yeah, like, uh, I don't care about sacrilege because, like, a car a, a, a car's not sacred. Mm -hmm. Especially and it's, when they made that many of them. Yeah, and it's probably not, like, bad to drive, but, like, I wouldn't go spending forty grand on a nine eleven with an LS swap. Like, it's not an LS motor is like not what I'm looking for from a nine eleven. Like, so like if you've had other nine elevens and you think this would be a novelty, like all right, but it it won't be a Porsche experience. It also the bummer with the LS as great as it is is it won't feel uh, exotic. Where I think. Even or even a regular 911 because it's the only flat six out there. Yeah, I know Subaru has one too. Uh, it sounds different from all the other cars, but with the LS, it's going to sound like a Camaro and a Corvette, yeah, and a, and a swapped RX-7 and a drift car and an FD. This like the the sound to me is so common. As much mm -hmm. as I love that engine, it just won't be as interesting. Right. Um, I, I would probably pass. I mean, if it was twenty five grand, you know, or maybe mm -hmm. now we're now we're now we're talking. Well, what is a what is a 997.1 like? Career S cost? 40, 40, 40 42, yeah, 45. That, that. I mean, yeah, yeah, I'd rather just have a regular one. Yeah. Last question. Justin says, this: these days there are so many versions of cars made off the same basic car. For instance, the Audi A3, S3, and RS3, et cetera. Obviously, we've seen lots of different exterior styling, but what is the most effective ways you've seen a manufacturer differentiate the interior of these cars? Um, I don't know, and then uses an example that I don't think makes I sense. That's a that's an example. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The example he used is one where the different the interior is not differentiated. Um, well, you've got uh, BMW. We talked about earlier with the crazy seats. You know, it's at a cer yeah. certain point, uh, manufacturers will change the complete seat to a Recaro or a bucket, a carbon bucket or something. 
um, for in the in the example of at the, at the very high end, but the Ferrari two nine six with the Assetto Fiorano package, and now you can get carbon bucket seats, carbon door mm. panels that are, that look nothing like the regular door panels, carbon floors, stuff like that. Um, uh, I mean, to a degree, if you go Porsche exec, uh, executive manufacturer, you can sure. like really change your dash color and your materials and things like that. I mean, that's not a great example because it's... Mm, I mean, the example of the Audi is not bad. The RS3 does have does have distinctly different elements to it than the A3. Is the dash and everything different, or is that the same? The basic dash is the same, but the gauge cluster is different. The seats are different. Uh, the door panels have contrast color and stuff like that. They're covered in leather. Um, and you could argue... Golf, like the Golf from Golf to RS3 or like GTI to RS3 if there's right. a lot of architecture shared that's also because the same uh, platform the Corvette I mean Cor the C8 Corvette if you go from a very base one to a super LT1 loaded up to one LT3 yeah that's true. The, there's a there's a noticeable difference there's a lot more leather a lot more carbon different colors of stuff you can do there's there's a significant difference there um mm -hmm. That's uh, that's about all I can that comes. I'm sure there's more, but like that's yeah. really what comes to mind right now. The more money you spend, basically, just the biggest it. change is usually when you do a performance seat, you know, a Recaro or a really lumbar heavy supportive seat versus the. I also think uh, as you go up in the market, like to S class, they usually offer a wider variety of materials for dashboards and things. Like, mm -hmm. I, like I drove that S-Class AMG that had a bare carbon dash, but you can also get it with leather or wood yeah. or like Bentley, stuff like that. Where, and and the, the base version of an S might have just black plastic. Yeah. Where, so that's something they change more um, yeah. than just the seats. Yeah. But the, I mean, the most effective ways, the question is what is the most effective ways? And I think the, the change to a performance seat and a performance steering wheel mm -hmm. and maybe gauge cluster are usually the the kind of giveaways that you're in the fast one. Gauges for sure. When yeah. it's the same, like the, the Civic Type R and the, yeah. I, the Type S, I think the gauges are very slightly different. But you yeah. look at the pod, you're like, oh, it's the same thing. Yeah. And the dash is the same. Yeah. All right. That is our show. We've got uh, Johnny Lieberman coming in tomorrow. I'm sure we'll find something to fight about. Uh, shout out to Ryan Zumalin, who sent us his new book, Cult of GTR. Go check that out. And to the lovely fans who have sent us some very fun gifts. This little Lambo is pretty cute. Um, and uh, thanks to all our patrons for their questions. And uh, we will see you guys tomorrow. Bye.